Living longer. Living healthier. Living better than ever before. Welcome to Mountain Pacific's Healthy Living for Life, a weekly series that gives you the information, education, and expert insight you need to become an active participant in today's ever-changing healthcare climate. Here now is today's program host. Breast cancer is the second most common type of cancer among women in the United States, with one in eight women developing invasive breast cancer at some point over the course of her lifetime. Welcome to Healthy Living for Life, a show dedicated to helping you do just that. I'm your host, Beth Brown. Today, we are talking all about breast cancer, from diagnosis to recovery and navigating the in-between. Stay with us. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to Healthy Living for Life. Joining us first this morning is Tammy Copenhaver, who is here to share with us her breast cancer story. And thank you so much for being here today, Tammy. Thank you. So let's start out by going back to your very earliest symptoms. Can you talk a little bit about how old you were and what first happened that kind of launched this story for you? So my story dates back about 15 years. Um, in 2006, 2007, 36, 37, uh, I had felt a lump, went to my OBG, and he then scheduled an appointment with a surgeon. Okay. So then the surgeon, at that time, mammograms were evolving and the practice was evolving. Mm -hmm. So by the time I discovered that there was an abnormal, abnormality, um, you know, a week had gone by and then I see the surgeon and then, you know, a few more days go by and then you have the mammogram. And then a few more days go by before you hear the results. Um, it's, it's not like it is now where everything's very quick and swift. Uh, so that started the process and that uh, surgeon then uh, scheduled an MR uh, MRI because we really couldn't tell anything on the mammograms because in those days they were still the films, mm -hmm. not the digital. Right. So with the MRI, uh, you have to wait and I uh, had the MRI, the MRI and it was inconclusive. Wow. So from that, then multiple mammograms every year from there on. And I can say in the last 15 years, probably a handful of times that I've only had a yearly mammogram. So in between all of that, even as kind of a pain that mammograms are, <laughs> I went because it was part of the process, and I worked with a gal that um, had mentioned that she had missed her mammogram, her yearly mammogram, and when she went back, they had discovered breast cancer, and mm -hmm. she thought that if she had gone to that yearly mammogram, it would have been discovered sooner. Right. So I always had that in the back of my mind. So fast forward 2021, and I had gone in for a follow-up mammogram, and they had seen something, so then they scheduled another follow-up within six months. I had gone back to the six-month one, and uh, then they had scheduled the follow-up with an ultrasound. So that's where the story starts mm -hmm. for 2021, and then uh, from that follow-up, uh, biopsy was scheduled, and so ensued treatment. And so were they talking about your breast cancer in like this is stage such and such or how did they talk to you about what was going on? So our, my breast cancer, I didn't really know a stage. I don't, I'm trying to remember. I think it was probably the MRI that I had right before surgery, before I knew what staged and my stage was 1A. I did know it was invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, but the healthcare team um, scheduled an MRI, scheduled genetic testing, scheduled all kinds of um, treatment because I traveled six hours to, to have all this care. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when I learned that it was 1A. Um, okay. But even so, I, in talking with the doctors and going through treatment, I, I gave them, I, I told them my mindset is when you tell me to worry, I will worry. That is a very strong mindset to have. And so did they ever tell you to worry? No, yeah. nobody has told me to worry. Um, they all agreed that was a good mindset because even knowing that I had uh, the positive diagnosis, 
I think because I had gone through 15 years and had that initial scare when my kids were small, I had already processed a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So when the official diagnosis came, it wasn't so much if I had breast cancer, it was when. And so when I had that diagnosis, um, I knew resolutely what was going to happen next. Okay. There was no question. And a lot of people would have been doing mammograms for as long as you had been doing mammograms because breast cancer is in their family history, but you said you did the genetic testing. Is breast cancer in your family? Breast cancer is not in my family. I did have uh, a brother with pancreatic cancer, so that's, the, that's why they initiated uh, the testing and because I have two daughters, but that was all negative. Okay, so tell us a little bit about your treatment process. I know you had to do a lot of driving back and forth. What kind of treatment were you getting? So basically, the treat, I, I elected for a bilateral mastectomy. So then um, I had to meet with a surgeon, a breast surgeon and a plastic surgeon, and discuss options from there. So I opted to have expanders placed at the, at the time of my mastectomy. So then uh, there's you know, weekly trips to have those filled. And then in the coming weeks, I will have my final reconstruction surgery where they will place the implants. And then I will begin my cancer medication treatment. Okay. Because of all the testing that they did, they, do, they, they dice and slice your tissue. And my Onca test came back very low. And with my hormones and the type of cancer, um, I was not a candidate for radiation, nor a candidate for chemotherapy. All I, uh, their recommendation was tamoxifen, but only after my final surgery. Okay, interesting. So we're actually running out of time, but I wanted to ask really quickly too, what about support services and other parts of the treatment that folks might not think about? Did you do anything like that? Um, the healthcare team was fantastic. They scheduled physical therapy, um, social work, it's incredible the care team that comes together when there's a diagnosis like this. Every kind of support you can imagine is offered. Awesome, so just to finish off really quickly and going through what you've gone through and are almost hopefully through uh, plus the medication, what advice would you give to women based on your experience? As much of a pain as those mammograms are, don't skip them. Perfect. Don't skip them, get okay. it. All right, thanks, Tammy, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Okay, and we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to be talking with a nurse navigator who is gonna talk about some of the support options that you can get if you're going through breast cancer. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Healthy Living for Life. Joining us now is Pam Sesser, who is a nurse navigator with St. Peter's Health, and thank you so much for being here with us today, Pam. Thank you, it's my pleasure to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. So let's just ask the obvious question, what does a nurse navigator do? Well, that's a really hard question to answer is because it? a nurse navigator does a lot of things. Yeah. Um, primarily, it's providing educational and emotional support and also care coordination. But there's a lot of other little nuances that get filled into that big picture of defining what a navigator does. It's an evolving role and um, it's constantly changing. So to be able to define exactly what it is is hard to say. <laughs> okay, and so yeah. it's important to note too that a nurse navigator is different from a nurse that you may just work with who works with your oncologist if you are diagnosed with cancer. Yeah, so primarily um, like our cancer treatment center nurses, they're mostly our infusion nurses. So they're the ones that are gonna be providing any kind of therapies. Um, and then they might be rooming the patients. A nurse navigator, at least from my standpoint, I start with a patient early on. So if they're recommended for a breast biopsy, that's when I get involved in the care. Um, sometimes people's biopsies come back negative, which is great. But if it comes back positive, then I kind of get really involved in their care. So I'll attend appointments with them, especially initial um, appointments, consultations, help take notes. I've always got an education binder that I review with patients and their family. Oh, nice. and then and I'm kind of that resource for people to reach out to if they have additional questions, especially, you know, when you're in a doctor's appointment and you're hearing things, but, you know, you're really kind of shut down. Mm -hmm. So they can reference back to my notes and then they can always call with questions or look through that binder that we have prepared um, with additional information. So it's just kind of having that constant support. 
Yeah, I bet people are very appreciative of that binder so that they have the information because I'm sure that stuff washes right over you when you're talking with a Absolutely. healthcare team. And so how do you interact with the healthcare team then? Well, we have a multidisciplinary approach at our hospital. So I'm com communicating with the radiologist, the medical oncologist, the general surgeon, the radiation oncologist, pathology, our nurse team, and social work. We have a financial navigator now, which is a very um, pivotal role um, to help because financial burden is so huge. A lot of times that takes precedence over somebody's stress of their cancer diagnosis. It's more the financial piece. So having that person involved and you know just being really tight and communicating very well with what's going on and what patients needs are and having those needs met is very important. And so how often do you help a patient get involved with support groups or different support resources that are out there? Well, pre-COVID, <laughs> oh, sure. all the time, but with COVID, it's definitely been a challenge. We haven't been able to offer as many classes um, or even support groups as we had in the past. I was very fortunate to just recently have been selected with Living Beyond Breast Cancer as one of their program leaders. So I was able to do some training through them and then provide a young women's initiative class um, through our hospital before things changed with COVID. Yeah. So that was really important because um, I was able to have young women, working women, and it also served not only as an education opportunity, but it helped them come together and support one another. And it was sort of like a mini support group that we didn't plan, it just kind of evolved to that. So it was great um, that course is finished right now, but I plan on doing it again. So it was so um, phenomenal just to, have the empowerment and watch these women, you know, share their stories and grow together. It's wow. just so rewarding. That's that's really one of the things, not really one, but one of the many things that I love about my job. Yeah, it sounds mm -hmm. great. And so what are some of the other resources that nurse navigators typically help patients who have been diagnosed with cancer get through and learn about? Yeah, so right now, um, one good thing with COVID, um, if there is anything good, yeah. is the cancer support community. They're based out of Bozeman, and they do a lot of support groups. And in the past, you'd have to be there to attend in person, but now they're able to host those virtually, which is great because now people are able to get in and network that way. Um, there's also another program called Immerman Angels, and that's a nationwide support group. It's a one-on-one -on -one group um, that is uh, it consists of people that are cancer survivors themselves and they go through additional training so then they can be um, a support person. So it's one on one. And so we also encourage people to do that. We have a social worker um, that works primarily with our oncology patients. So we get patients in touch with her as well and she can kind of do an intake to see where their needs are and then place them with a therapist out in the community that would be a great fit for them and their families. We will sometimes do family um, meetings for patients, young moms um, that are going to be starting chemotherapy. So the social worker and I will have a family meeting with the you know, family and their children to help the kids understand what's going to happen with mom. Mm -hmm. And we can usually give them a tour of the cancer center so it's not as scary. And then kids can accept that a lot easier and, you know, process through so they're not so scared thinking mom's going and having these really bad things happening. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. And so what about resources for rural folks? We talked with Tammy before the break about she had to do a lot of driving for her treatment and mm -hmm. the different things she had to do. Maybe COVID has helped a little bit with that too, but can you speak to what are the resources for people who do live outside of urban areas? Well, there's a lot of stuff online. Um, one of the things I highly recommend is the Living Beyond Breast Cancer. They're based out of Philadelphia, but it is a na nationwide um, group. Cool. And they've got a lot of webinars and different um, interactive classes and stuff that people can take. And then I also encourage people to just go on different websites that are evidence-based as the American Cancer Society, Come in, um, you know, so those types of things, because again, it is hard in the rural areas. And I know some people, because they are small communities, they formed their own little support groups. So just, you know, encouraging people to reach out in their own community to see what's out there. Okay, we're just about out of time, but just really quickly, how do people find you? How do they find Nurse Navigators? So I'm listed on our website at St. Peter's, but I encourage anybody if they're going to another facility to just start with their oncology team. And normally they have people listed. Not everybody has a Nurse Navigator, but they at least have advocates that they can reach out to. So just start with their you know, hospital website and they can find contact. You can reach me. <laughs> um, my number is 4906495. 
5-6-7-8-0. Okay, great. So that's yeah. for folks who are in the Helena area. I yes. Would mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Pam. Oh, we appreciate sure. your Thank time. you. Okay, we need to take another break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about treatment options for breast cancer. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Healthy Living for Life. Joining us now is Dr. Virginia Borges, who is an oncologist who's going to talk to us about breast cancer treatments and how they've changed over the years. So thanks so much for being with us this morning, Dr. Borges. We appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. So let's start first and just talk about cancer in general. We know cancer is a group of different types of diseases. So um, are there also different types of breast cancer? Absolutely. Um, cancer by definition is our own cells having gone wrong and crossed over to the dark side and becoming cells that survive and invade and metastasize and do bad things. Um, within breast cancer, we've begun to be able to refine the different subtypes of breast cancer based on certain markers that we look for being expressed on the cancer cells themselves. So anyone who's experienced a breast cancer diagnosis will likely have heard terms of estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and something called HER2 nu, which is a gene that is particularly important in helping us define which subtype of breast cancer a woman has been diagnosed with. And that um, reflects the biology of the cancer, how aggressive or problematic is this cancer going to be? And also it helps us define what types of treatments are the most important for that person. And, you know, in the modern era, this biology and the understanding of the biology is almost superseding what used to be the most important part of cancer diagnosis, which was the stage. And so amongst the different breast cancers that we treat, different stages will have far better prognosis regardless of, um, of being a little bit more advanced or a higher stage because we have such great therapies because of the biology of the cancer itself. And is a lump typically what someone at home can, you know, the red flag that people look for? Or are there other symptoms that people should be looking for when it comes to a possibility of breast cancer? Yeah, so it depends on a person's age. Uh, we certainly hope that women, particularly here in the United States where this is a, a routine part of healthcare are engaging in screening so that if they get diagnosed with breast cancer, it's as early of a diagnosis as we can facilitate based on today's technologies. But, you know, there are many younger women who are also potentially at risk for getting diagnosed with breast cancer, and some of them are even screening is currently recommended, meaning 40 for the average risk woman. And so, yes, any changes in the breast, a lump or a pain that doesn't make sense or a dimple or a divot or something that just um, wasn't there before, a swelling, the entire breast may be looking red or inflamed. All of those are warning symptoms that someone should go in and get checked. Now, not all of those will result in a breast cancer diagnosis. And I think the biggest thing that we see is women seeing a change in their breasts can be afraid. And the most important thing is to just go in and get it checked because even if it is a breast cancer diagnosis, we have treatments, we have ways of dealing with this, we can help them get over it and move on in life and keep them healthy. The last thing we wanna see happen is someone ignore warning signs and come to us with something that we would have been able to better treat had they come sooner. And so how do you confirm those warning signs are breast cancer? How is it de detected and ultimately diagnosed? Sure. So if a young woman comes in or an any age woman comes in and she has noticed a lump in her breast, the first thing that will happen will be an ultrasound of that area, which does a very targeted look at the breast tissue and says, hey, does this look normal? Does it not look normal? If it doesn't look normal, is it something obvious like a cyst where we don't think we have to worry about it and it should go away versus does it have more concerning features? And then also depending on the scenario that's usually followed up with right away in conjunction with a mammogram. Um, and those two things will help define whether there is a concern here for which a biopsy is going to be recommended versus a short-term interim follow-up where they come back in six months as opposed to a year, or did they get great results and it's not concerning and they can be released home without anything to worry about. And so that's kind of the three directions it can go. When should women start getting mammograms? 
It depends on their risk. And so it's always important for a woman to know what has happened in her family. Um, anyone who has a strong family history of breast cancer, particularly if any in anyone in the family was diagnosed at a very young age, should talk to their doctor about that. But a general recommendation would be 10 years younger than the youngest woman at diagnosis or age 25 if somebody's very high risk, like they know they have an inherited mutation that puts them at very high risk of breast cancer. If you're an average risk woman, it depends on whose guidelines you want to follow. Um, as an oncologist who treats young women with breast cancer, I would recommend that women start at age 40 and pursue annual mammograms until they reach an age where it does not make sense for them to keep doing that. And so that would be based on their health and their older age and whether going in for mammograms makes sense within, when you're 75, 80 years of age. If you're doing great and you're a very healthy old woman and there's an expectation that you could easily live another five to 10 years, well then keep going. But if things have changed and your health is at the point where you're in the declining years and longevity is less than that, then it does not make sense to keep doing screening. But for an average risk woman between those two ages, um, annually is the um, what I would recommend. There are some task force guidelines that say you could do less than that and still be serving yourself well by going every other year when you're older or starting at age 50 if you are in a low risk population. But I'll be honest, as a treater of breast cancer, I like 40 and annual, okay. and that's what I do. <laughs> Sounds good. And then if a biopsy comes back where treatment is necessary, what are the treatment options and how has those options changed over the years? Well, the good news is that it's so complex, we're not going to have the opportunity to get through all of that in this interview. But the bottom line is there's a lot of surgical choices. And so depending on the size of the tumor, the size of the breast, the woman's personal desires for not only taking care of the breast cancer, cancer that's been diagnosed, but possibly also doing prevention against future breast cancer is whether we're gonna focus just on the tumor at hand or consider a larger surgery. Um, uh, your earlier guest talked about having bilateral mastectomies, so that incorporates both prevention of future breast cancer and treatment of current breast cancer in one fell swoop. That's right for some women, that's not right for all women. So standard options would be something like a lumpectomy, probably followed by radiation therapy or not, depending on the age of the woman and the type of the breast cancer. Similarly, a woman could choose to do one mastectomy and just remove the affected breast, or women could choose to do bilateral mastectomies have to emphasize that taking off the other breast, which does not have cancer in it, is really just for prevention. It doesn't help with the cancer at hand, and it is not life-saving for the treatment of the cancer at hand. So it comes down to serious personal choice. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Borges. That's actually our time. So we're going to have to stop there, but I very much appreciate your expertise and you being on with us this morning. Thank you. We didn't even get into any of the medical oncology, which is what I actually do for a living. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that. We'll have to have you on again sometime. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And thank, Bye -bye. thank you so much for joining us this morning. We hope you'll come back and see us again next week. Until then, stay fit, stay well, and stay healthy for life with Healthy Living for Life. Healthy Living for Life is brought to you by Mountain Pacific Quality Health in partnership with AARP Montana. We'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for future programs, visit our website at mpqhf.org or call us at 406-443-4020. You can also catch us on YouTube by visiting our website and clicking on the Healthy Living for Life logo. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions. 